everybody. Welcome to the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission board meeting of September 10th, 2019. I hope you all have had a good summer so far. It's almost over. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, does anyone have any adjustments to the agenda for tonight? Other than perhaps a rearranging of orders. Yep. Yeah, our speaker isn't here yet, so we may have to <laughs> adjust the agenda a little bit just to accommodate him. Um, I, yeah, there he is. is. <clears throat> I forgot to invite you to dinner. Uh, before we start, I forgot, we usually go around the room and introduce <coughs> ourselves. Um, I'll start. I'm Laura Hill Eubanks, uh, Commissioner from Northfield and Chair of the CVRPC. Bonnie Wellinger, staff. I'm John Copans with the Council on Rural Development. Don LaHaye, Waitsfield. Rich Turner, Williamstown. Ron Crowell, Middlesex. Jerry D'Amico, Roxbury. And Bob Wernick, Berlin. Lee Catania, Orange. Uh, Michael Bray, Woodbury. Kirby Keaton, Montpelier. Julie Potter, East Montpelier. John Brabant, Cows. Jack Pauley, East Montpelier, Alternate. Peter Kirby, Washington. Robin Shunk, Marshfield. Paula Emery, Plainfield, Alternate. Amy Hornblast, Cabot. Bill Eric, Worcester. Claire Rock, South. And Steve Watsbeach from Waterbury, Vice Chair. Thank you. <coughs> um, are there any comments from anyone from the public? Hearing none, I think we'll get started if you're ready. Our speaker tonight is John Copans from the Vermont Council on Rural Development. And he's going to talk about climate economy model community. Hi, folks. Um, I think I'm going to stand. I see some familiar faces here. Uh, so, uh, as I uh, introduce myself, I'm John Copan with the uh, Council on Rural Development. And I run a program called the Climate Economy Model Communities Program that a few of you are familiar with. And apologies for like rushing in here right at 6 30. I was at a Burlington meeting that went a few minutes late, and things were scheduled pretty tight today. So I guess a first question as we get started is just how many of you know of the Council on Rural Development and our work? Like, give me a show of hands if you're familiar with the PCR. That's, uh, that's helpful. So we are, uh, many of you probably know of our work because of our executive director, Paul Costello, who's been with the organization for about 15 years and is uh, a man about the state, right? Paul, Paul uh, is, has his hand in a lot of conversations all over, all over the state of Vermont. But um, I want to just give you a little bit of a sense of what VCRD is as an organization uh, before I talk about the Model Communities Program, because I think it's helpful to give you a feel for, um, for what we do uh, before I fo focus in on the program that I, I direct. So as you can see from this big list, uh, VCRD is actually one of 16 rural development councils around the country, state rural development councils. And we um, essentially were created in, uh, as part of uh, the United States Farm Bill back in the mid 80s. And this is, a, this is a problem that I think you all will appreciate, which is uh, back in the mid 80s there was, and there still is, some sense that there's all of these federal, state, and local programs trying to serve rural America and a real lack of integration between all those different programs, right? You've got, um, you've got a lot of different players trying to serve rural communities and, and sometimes uh, uh, working at cross purposes or not in, in an integrated way. And so what, uh, what, what, the rural, what the Council on Rural Development does as our board is it brings a lot of those players together. We have federal uh, appointees, we have members of the congressional delegation staff, we have appointees uh, of the administration, uh, we have local representatives, nonprofit, uh, private uh, representatives as well, all around our table. It's really a lot of our strength as an organization is that diverse board of folks uh, that we have at the Council on Rural Development. 
And I should say, you guys should feel free to interrupt me as I go here. Bonnie said, be prepared for that. Like, do, do not hesitate just to, um, to just shout out questions or, or, or whatever you have. What's wrong with the Red Sox? <laughs> so um, I, I want to just give you a sense of the work that we do. Uh, those of you who know of VCRD may know uh, that we do something called community visits. Uh, the, interestingly, when we look at our portfolio of work in Washington County in central Vermont, we've actually only done one community visit here uh, in our, we've probably done about 60 around the state, only one in Washington County, which is a little bit interesting, which was in Cabot in, I think, around 2012. Actually, I've got another slide, but listen. So community visits is really the core of our work. Uh, I'll explain that a little bit more in a bit. Uh, as part of our work, we also have the Climate Economy Initiative. That's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. That's our sort of, uh, we, we have themed conversations in communities or called the Model Communities Program. But we also convene something called the Climate Economy Action Team that develops a, pl a, a policy agenda around the climate economy. Uh, we, are, we are, in the last few years, really focusing on leadership development in Vermont. I think, and again, this is something you all will really relate to, the strength of our communities is so much about the strength of our local leaders and those people who roll up their sleeves and try to get things done in, in their local communities. And what we see is some opportunity to really try to cultivate that leadership. And so, in fact, we, uh, in August, had our second annual Vermont Leadership Summit. I don't, did anybody here go to that? Oh, excellent. So um, that was down in Randolph, uh, you know, 400 plus people thinking about how are we, how are we doing a better job of, of cultivating community leadership. And then we've also, for the last five or six years, been working on working lands uh, and, and really cultivating that conversation. So that just gives you a little sense of what, uh, what VCRD does as an organization. I mentioned the community visit, and I want to just describe this a little bit. And actually, all these pictures are from Marshfield and Plainfield, uh, just to uh, give them a little shout out, because that's, that's the most recent process that I've been doing. But um, I want to just describe this process, because it's really a lot about uh, who we are as a facilitative organization. What, what we do with a community visit, first of all, we're invited into communities. We never go somewhere where we're not invited. And the idea is to bring a community together as, in, in as robust a way as possible. As many people from a community, and, and, and we sort of, it's a, it's a three-step engagement process where the first step is a series of forums uh, that are really brainstorming forums. Uh, the second step is a prioritization meeting where you use sticker voting to, to, as a community to decide on some priorities. And then the third step is um, to develop action plans around those priorities. You know, we call it resource day. And a couple of important things um, I would mention about this. We bring in a, a visiting team at the first step in the process, the community visit day and the community resource day. And I will tell you that, um, and that resource team, maybe it's USDA Rural Development, maybe it's the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, but always, wherever we go, part of that visiting team is the Regional Planning Commission and their staff, right? Because no matter what your community is working on, that partnership with the RPC and the RPC staff is so fundamental. We see it again and again, right? Those towns that are able to effectively engage their RPC and, frankly, you know, um, get as much RPC attention and service are the ones that tend to, to, to do a little better because they, they get some of the technical expertise that they might not have locally. And so that's part of what our, our model is, is to bring in these, this supporting cast of a visiting team into a community to really help provide some technical assistance. But it also does something else important, right? When you're um, let's say you're uh, Ted Brady, the Deputy Secretary of the <coughs> Agency of Commerce and Community Development. You spend a lot of time in the State House. You spend a lot of time in your office. 
What you don't necessarily do is spend a lot of time in little Vermont towns listening to Vermonters talk about uh, the issues that are important to them. And when we have one of these community visit conversations, it, it, it brings those folks who get stuck a little bit, and uh, you know, I'm one of them, in this Montpelier bubble, it brings them out into small Vermont towns, and it gives them a chance to sort of put their finger on the pulse of what people are talking about in their communities. And that's, so it's really a two-way conversation, right? And there's real value for those state players in coming into those, those community conversations, and there's value in, for those communities in bringing some of that attention and resources. Um, so, yeah? Could you say more about the blue box? The like, blue. who's the steering committee? And oh, yeah, that's, I didn't mention they're that. They're brainstorming the topics yeah, that will be discussed. Yeah, so what, the way we start the process is that we, um, as staff, make a whole bunch of phone calls into a community. <coughs> and we say, we're putting together a little meeting of about 20 to 25 people. And we're recruiting sort of a good mix of people to come be in that room to really build that process. And there's a little bit of an art to it. Which, so which, what you're trying, you sort of form almost like a map of the interconnectedness in a community. You get a feel for what are the constituencies. And what you want is not everybody from one little group of friends. What you want is that mix of, of a lot of different constituencies, a lot of different groups, different age groups, different regions in communities, different socioeconomic areas, you know, parents with kids, like all you, so we try to put together a mix of people and that group is, their real core job is to make the community visit day as successful as possible. So we do, I'll actually show you a slide later of what our outreach plan looks like, but they really design a whole outreach plan to reach out to the community and they're kind of the foot soldiers to, to promote that, that kickoff event. And you get their contact in like from people? From people. Getting, a lot of from conversations from, with people saying, hey, who should be around this table? Mm -hmm. You know, like who's the right person? And it's an interesting thing because a lot of people will say, oh, well, how about the five members of our select board? And we'll say, how about one of those members of the select board? How about one member of the planning commission? And how about who's a member of the PTA? What about the local uh, church in the community? Who's in the church? What about the, the soccer coach? Right? You're, you're trying to tap into some of those networks that are maybe not always tapped into because you really want to cast that net as broad as you can as you get the process started. So, um, so this is just a little snapshot of our work. I thought it would be helpful to sort of give some sense of where, as I mentioned, we did a community visit, in, a full community visit in Cabot in 2012. We did the Creative Communities Program in Plainfield in 2007, uh, E-Vermont. So we did two programs called the E-Vermont program and the Digital Economy program. Those were in a bunch of towns around the state, and a lot of you all or your towns participated in those programs, as you can see. And then the Model Communities program, we are working right now in Marshfield and Plainfield, the ramp process, as we call it. Um, uh, and then uh, <coughs> Community Visit, to Barry coming in early 2020, actually. So that finally there will be another town that we add to our community <coughs> visit list for Washington County, which is Barry coming early early next year. That would be Barry Town and Barry City, or you know, it's Barry City. But when we have these conversations, typically we say, you know, you ask that steering committee, <coughs> you know, are, do, if people from Barry Town come to the meeting, like, is that okay? And uh, <coughs> Universally, people say, yeah, if you care about Barry, you're welcome, right? Where it's not like it's sort of like you got to be registered to vote or, or anything. It's not that level of formality. Uh, so now I just want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the climate economy program. And let me just say, <coughs> one of the ways that VCRD sort of thinks about its work and defines its portfolio of work is that we start to identify patterns in the communities that we're in. So when we host these community visit conversations, you start to identify, like, around the digital economy. Probably 10 or 15 years ago, a lot of towns were thinking about broadband and about how they should embrace this sort of, that transition, that, that uh, telecommunications transition. So we did the whole digital economy program. 
uh, uh, working lands. Similarly, we, we heard a lot from communities about working lands. We started to, to sort of focus in on that. And now, for the last really three and a half years, we've been focused in on what we call the climate economy. We held two statewide summits uh, at VTC in 2015 and 2016. We held another big sort of national summit up in Burlington in 2017. We published this, which is called Progress for Vermont, a set of recommendations. When we talk about the climate economy at, at VCRD, what, what we mean is kind of encapsulated by that quote, which is to think uh, <coughs> climate change by all means is a threat. It's an ecological threat and it's an economic threat uh, to our way of life, but it's also uh, to flip that uh, an opportunity. The things that we do in our communities to address climate change also increase our quality of life in our communities and can increase sort of the affordability and the livability of our communities. So, so trying to um, elevate the conversation around climate and see that some of those things that we might do under the guise of re reducing carbon emissions also have a whole other host of benefits for communities and, um, and really trying to engage a broader group of people in the, in the conversation around the climate economy. You know, one of the, con this, it's a terrible chart, but like, basically for the last 200 plus years, since the Industrial Revolution, economic growth and the burning of fossil fuels were totally married together, right? So when the economy grew, you burned more fossil fuel. And when you're, the economy went down, you burned less fossil fuel, right? Those lines just traveled <coughs> parallel. And what we are finally seeing in developed countries around the world is the decoupling of those lines, right? Where you actually are having economic growth and reducing fossil fuel use. And I think that's, that's sort of what, uh, part of what we're talking about when we talk about the climate economy. It's part of what we aspire to, is how do we have a, a, a healthy economy while also uh, reducing uh, climate carbon emissions. Um, next slide. Bar Bonnie, I feel terrible that you're doing this because I sent you a PDF. But, you know, that, that, chart, that, that chart was a macro chart right, of, of, of glo sort of national economies. But I think it's really important to think about the climate economy from a household level too, which is, um, this is actually an old number. They've updated this a little bit uh, recently. I need to, but essentially, as a household, we all spend about $5,000 annually on our energy costs, whether that's oil, uh, electricity, or putting gas in our, our various vehicles. You know, for a, for a low to middle income family, that $5,000 is a significant piece of that uh, annual budget of that family. And so, uh, how, and, and when you look at it, transportation, right? Transportation, I think, and that's just the gas, by the way, right? It's not the cost of owning the vehicle, maintaining the vehicle, insuring the vehicle. That $2,500 we're spending filling up our tanks every year, it's one of those expenses that I think blends in for a lot of us because you just go to the gas pump every week or two and you just fill up the tank and it just sort of, until you separate it out and you say, wow, that's a, and if you think about everybody in your community spending that money uh, every couple of weeks at the gas tank, it really adds up to a pretty significant economic drain uh, for, our, for, for all Vermonters. Uh, and particularly for our for our rural communities. So, uh, boy, this is a busy busy chart. This so I described to you. Um, so let me give you a little bit of history about sort of the work I've been doing at at, uh, uh, at BCRD. I was hired in the beginning of 2017 to launch this thing called the Climate Economy Model Communities Program, and the idea was we have our community visit process that is general in theme. Let's do something similar, but have a theme around the climate economy. And uh, we launched that in 2017. We've now, we've worked basically in two communities each year for the last three years. We've actually secured some <coughs> financial support to continue our work into 2020 and 2021. So like this chart gives you that same community visit process, right, where we have that planning meeting that I was describing, the kickoffs, the community meeting, 
and then the breaking into task force work. The difference here is we have a broad theme to this conversation around the climate economy, and we even focus it in a little bit more because transportation and energy use are so much a part of the climate economy, we sort of focus in on those as forum topics as we get the conversation going, and we say, you know what, it's up to you to decide what you want to do as a community around transportation or around home and business energy opportunities, but part of the program is providing support to you in tackling those topics generally because they're so much fundamental to what the climate economy is and to that household budget sort of um, picture. So that's, um, I think, uh, just gives you, a, in a really sort of messy chart, a little overview of sort of the work that we do. Um, I want to just share with you, oh, you asked uh, that question. So like, for us, one of the really important things about our work is spreading the word as deeply and broadly, I guess, as we can. So this is just an example of like, we put that steering committee team to work in the four weeks between when we have that first planning meeting and we have the kickoff, we sort of deploy this whole program of promotion to spread the word for that kickoff. Because what we know is the bigger that group of people is who participates in that kickoff, the stronger that conversation is going to be. The more diverse voices you bring into that conversation, the more likely you are to have some uh, success at the end of the day. So that just gives you a little snapshot of like how uh, we take this part of the work really seriously. And here's the thing about it is not very much of this actually costs a lot of money. And in fact, the most effective part of it is like the phone calls and the targeted outreach, right? Neighbors talking to neighbors saying, hey, there's this, this, this meeting happening in this community meal. Come on out. Like that's what's going to make a difference in terms of turnout. We, I guess we do spend money on a mailing, right? Because we want to just have that basic invitation go to everybody, everybody on the mailing list in a community. But otherwise, there's not a whole lot of sort of financial expense. It's more about sort of the grassroots work of, of promoting the kickoff. So I want to just give you, a, I guess, a feel for some of our work. Um, we, and I, Randolph, uh, we just wrapped up our work in Randolph about um, in the spring. It's not too far down the road, and so I figured that would be a good one to highlight. We, um, as you can see, what Randolph prioritized for work and this was before we sort of said that transportation was sort of fundamental to the program. So you'll see their priorities were around school and municipal energy use, uh, home and business energy use. And then they had two other priorities around um, sort of strengthening downtown Randolph. For those of you who know De Randolph, about two plus years ago, Belmaine's. Anybody ever shop at Belmaine's? really nice little department store in downtown Randolph, it closed. Mm. And that was sort of this catalyst moment for the community of like, oh man, we, we lost Belmaine's. Like that's, that's one of those like canary in the coal mine sort of moments for them about the health of their downtown. And so a lot of focus on sort of downtown Randolph and how do we attract more people <clears throat> into Randolph as a way to sustain our economy. And so what has happened is we have four task forces with local leaders working on these four different priorities. And where I think, where I really enjoy this work is there's a lot of crossover between these task forces. And interesting things happen across the task forces as they do their work. I take really seriously the, the responsibility of making sure those task forces are communicating with each other and also communicating with the other existing players in a community. Right, like it's. Uh, I, I'm always really sensitive to when when there's an existing group working on an existing project, and then this process rolls into a community. How do those things integrate together and not duplicate effort? Right? How to because we don't have, frankly, enough resources to be duplicating uh, effort. So um, that just sort of gives you a little feel for one of the towns where we've where we've done some work. You know, the Energy Committee really focused on, um, we have a real partnership with Efficiency Vermont as part of this program. 
they rolled out free home energy visits, uh, and, the Ener and the energy task force really focused on promoting those home energy visits. They really focused on um, rental property owners and how do we get rental property owners to make energy efficiency improvements to their, to their buildings. Um, and uh, EV charging, right? The group focused on strengthening downtown was, uh, uh, did some work around electric vehicle charging, just to give you a little flavor of the work. So the way that the program is structured is we do that three months of intense sort of public engagement with those three meetings and then I provide another like seven or eight months of sort of uh, technical assistance and support uh, from VCRD, obviously working with partners as well uh, in, doing, in, in providing that support. Another example of the work we did in Middlebury, uh, they did something called the Neighborhood Energy Project where they, they carved off a neighborhood of 100 houses and they said, we're going to talk to every single household in this neighborhood. We're going to try to get them to say yes to a free home energy visit. And, uh, and we're going to give them a free smart thermostat as part of this process. So the, Id the idea, again, is really leveraging those neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor relationships, working with the utility in the back end, because ultimately they are the ones with some resources to deliver the home energy visits and with some expertise. And, and so... Um, that's just an example of the type of work that has emerged as part of the model uh, model communities program. Uh, finally, just because it's it's uh, local and um, it's the work that's happening right now, this is the set of priorities that are uh, that are have been identified uh, as part of revitalizing all Marshfield and Plainfield or the ramp process. Um, they are thinking about how to support and strengthen both village centers uh, in those two communities. And you can't really think about those two village centers without talking about Route 2, right? Route 2 is, I mean, for a lot of our towns, right, these state roads that run through our communities are so dominant. So we're really, um, you know, I'm looking at Paula here because she's part of this team. We're really, the, this question, uh, and, and talking to Dan Courier, right? This is where the partnership with the Regional Planning Commission is so fundamental, right? Because the question is, if they're doing a major repaving of Route 2 in 2022 or 2023, how does Marshfield and Plainfield effectively get their voice into that conversation and make some streetscape improvements as part of that work? And how, you know, Dan understands sort of the ways of VTRANS in a way that I don't and that folks locally in Marshfield and Plainfield don't. So, like, how do we deploy Dan effectively and um, how do we, uh, how do these communities become, um, articulate what those, those needs are and really figure out what are the avenues of communication to be effective there? Sure. Um, yeah. So and I'd be given, I, I live in Calais, but I did spend a lot of time traveling through and visiting uh, Marshfield and Plainfield. Yeah. It's really a neighboring, it's a neighboring community. Um, and, you know, the through traffic, the truck traffic is such a big deal. And it, it's, it's devastating to the little communities. It's devaluated properties or properties being abandoned. It's impossible to live on. Yep. Randolph, I'm not Randolph, Danville had similar issues. Totally. And AOT back when they wanted to widen and speed traffic through even all the all the more, and the community rose up, and they pushed back. And AOT engineers, yeah, you know, said no, we're doing it our way, the highway, literally, and um, our way and the highway, and they pushed <laughs> back. And the long uh, long story made short is that we have what we we have now, and. In Danville, Danville. It's, it's kind of a poster child, it's right? It's a poster it's, child. They yeah. did uh, traffic calming. Uh, you know you're in a community sidewalks. when you drive through. It's Danville. beautiful. Yeah, yeah. It's beautiful, and, and I, I have this vision, um, not as one of your community leaders, uh, but as a, a regular visitor. It, it seems something similar happened to the Marshfield Plainfield community. I don't know if that's well. Have you it's invited exactly, the Danville I folks mean, it's, in? Well, it's what. Uh, it, and I think a little bit of an autopsy to understand how did Danville unleash right. that. That's, right. There was obviously a heavy amount of dollars involved in that project. Mm -hmm. It's both dollars and like persuasion to get those. You know, I think. Well, yeah. My <laughs> guess is Danville has a representative in the legislature that lives in Danville, That's and right. she 
has a lot of relatives in Danville, so they're very <laughs> persuasive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there's some position. But the yes. community did rise up. It I mean, did. there was like mm -hmm. protests. Yeah, but like, and, and yeah. honestly, I feel like that's where there's such overlap between the work that Council on Rural Development does and the work that you all do uh, and the RPC does is like helping communities realize that kind of a vision and what do they need ultimately to get it done. Like, ha and, and, and it's, so that's, um, yeah, a good example. Uh, they, in Plainfield, Marshfield, are also working to build a farm and food network uh, there and strengthen that farm and food network. And they've plugged in uh, with the folks in Cabot because there's already an existing sort of agricultural network in Cabot that they're uh, communicating with. Uh, on the transportation front, I would say they're really in sort of information gathering mode to get started. You know, there's, um, there's the Route 2 commuter uh, that uh, has, um, uh, I think, has potential to e have greater ridership. And there's some improvements to that coming, right, in relation to a connection to Barry uh, for some folks coming uh, out of uh, both of those towns. And so what that task force has decided at this point is they don't want to sort of reinvent the wheel given the set of offerings from Go Vermont and some of the existing resources. They really want to understand better what those resources are and then figure out what are some key opportunities for them uh, to, uh, to make a difference. Transportation to me is like the most enticing topic but also the biggest conundrum. Like it's really hard to know um, how we reduce those single occupancy vehicle trips. Like it's a, it's a, a in our small little communities where we live uh, all over the place. Like it's, it's a real dilemma. So, but it's also that's what makes it fun. Uh, and then the group that's working on energy uh, more generally is really focused at this point on two things. They're focused on Twinfield School. Uh, Twinfields made great progress. They heat with biomass. They've done some insulation, but. There's a little bit further to go for Twinfield, and this group really wants to work with the school district to get those final improvements to the school building. And then the other thing they're doing is to um, deploy. <coughs> Interestingly, when you look at census data from Marshfield and Plainfield, uh, almost uh, half of both communities heat primarily with wood. To, and that, that, that sort of fits with, I think, how we probably perceive those, the, the, those communities. Probably true of a bunch of other Washington County towns as well. So uh, a lot of those folks are probably using pretty inefficient older wood stoves. There's a great wood stove change out program right now that, that both increases air quality, but also really reduces the amount of wood you need to buy every year because you, you switch over to a, a so, so this group's going to deploy a campaign around modern wood heating, both targeted at those people who are already heating with wood to see if they have opportunities to do that more efficiently for those who are motivated to do so, but also for those people heating with oil or propane who want to um, expand their energy choices or change them um, to maybe transition over. So that just gives you a feel um, for the other work that we're doing um, here in Washington County. John, before yeah. you move on, um, another uh, conundrum, if you will, along with transportation, I think, is um, making buildings more energy efficient. You mentioned uh, Twinfield School, but uh, there seems to be huge opportunities for conservation of energy through weatherization, and it seems to be a very, very challenging um, not to crack, if you will, for many communities. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you found these communities deal with that uh, issue, especially with older uh, building stock? Uh, I would say, it, first of all, like a lot of alignment in the communities with your point, which is uh, everywhere we go, people say, you know what, like, Solar's kind of nice looking, but the real challenge is we've really got to deal with the thermal shell piece, mm -hmm. especially with our aging housing stock. Mm -hmm. That said, like there's just, um, it's, a, it's tough. Mm -hmm. Like it's uh, the, um, it's, and it's tough I think for a few different reasons. One, the finance, you know, it's, it's expensive, but it's also sort of complicated, and it's, um, I think, 
we, uh, that partnership with Efficiency Vermont means that we can sort of, as communities want to dive into that, they've got a really good partnership there. I don't know if you, there is, as part of legislative uh, session last year, they actually uh, are going to deploy a little bit more money in the sort of middle income tier for better weatherization work. Uh, and that's getting rolled out. If it hasn't already been rolled out, it's going to be rolled out shortly. And I think there's some hope that that, um, what we see is the low income weatherization program is humming along pretty good. And people who qualify for free weatherization through that, that, I mean, in, there are some places where they can't meet the demand for that. But that, that it's that next tier of Vermonters uh, who don't qualify for weatherization that really have a hard time getting it done. I don't have an easy answer for you. you no, know, I know the answer's not easy, but that's helpful. Yeah, yeah. But, but I will say, what we don't do is gloss over that topic, okay. right? I, you know, I don't know if folks saw, uh, this is an aside, but Burlington, you know, you've got to love a city with the resources of Burlington. They engage a whole team of consultants to, to basically map out their pathway to net zero in 2030, and they just released that plan yesterday. <coughs> and what I was really interested to see is they, you know, if you take that into 100%, like 100% of the work they need to do to get to net zero, 60% of that was on the building, what they called sort of the electrifying of the heating sector, uh, and 15% of that was for district heating, and then the remainder of that was transportation. So I, to me, that was really interesting. How, and of course, the energy efficiency piece is embedded in that 60%, uh, I think in terms of how they get there. How we heat our buildings and how efficient our buildings are is really, um, it's, it's huge, right? It's, and the other piece I think about, and we, you, John, you mentioned it, you know, we have these, uh, a lot of houses that, Frank, that have seen better days, right? And mm -hmm. some of them are vacant, some of them um, are just, they don't seem all that habitable and you know they're terribly inefficient homes, right? So there's that nexus between what, how healthy are those homes and how efficient are those homes. And it just seems like there's some deep work we need to do uh, to really tackle that in, in so many of our, of our communities. So. Uh, a little bit of recruitment, which is we are gonna recruit uh, com uh, another community to participate in this process in 2020. And we're actually changing our program a little bit. We are, um, we're going to launch something, and this is a temporary name maybe for this. I'm calling it the Community Climate Economy Accelerator. But the idea is, in addition to doing that full model communities process in, with one community in 2020, I'm also going to recruit like eight to ten community-based leaders who are working on climate and energy issues. We're going to do a little bit of leadership training with that group. But then we're going to do a, a lot of hand-holding as they work on a project in their community. And the idea is, let's provide a, a level of direct support to people who are trying to get things done in their communities and share some of the lessons learned and bring in some partners in doing that work. You know, to be part of the reason we are restructuring things a little bit is, when you look at that big public engagement process that I described, the sense I get is some communities don't always have the appetite for that level of big public engagement process, or the timing isn't right for them. So like this little sort of accelerator is going to be um, a little more targeted. It's a way, um, if someone's really motivated to work on a project in their community, we want to be a partner to them in, in, in doing that work. So I will mention also, you know, we talked a little bit uh, to the Mad River Valley about the possibility of doing work for this year, the timing wasn't right for 2019, but that conversation's ongoing for 2020 as well. So it's when we think about that one, one big convening process, uh, the Mad River Valley is uh, a possible candidate. We're starting to have that conversation again with them. So that's, um, that's my information. <laughs> yeah. Um, Steve mentioned the issue about dealing with energy efficiency in, of, of structures, thermal efficiency of structures. Yeah. Um, and a lot of our, and, and you talked a little bit about um, 
in some cases working with rental properties. One of the real challenges for um, in, in the affordable housing, afford, I'm not in the, the formal term, but the generally more affordable housing in many towns are, are mobile homes. And they are notorious in terms of their ability to get any kind of thermal efficiency and do anything. And it's a population that frankly can't make much of an investment. Um, and do you, have you encountered any ideas or opportunities that can, that can you know, help it's, that? This isn't specific to mobile homes, but I know that NeighborWorks of Western Vermont is doing a little pilot program in Arlington, I think. And it's targeted to um, sort of those low-income folks. It may be an ownership situation as opposed to a rental situation, but low-income folks who have homes that need significant work. And, and they're piloting, I don't have details as you can tell, but they're piloting something where they come up with a way to finance some significant rehab of those homes. And uh, I'm pretty curious about that because I feel like that fills uh, a niche as we were talking about. So much of our housing stock is in need of, of attention uh, and it's, uh, it's a real challenge. For mobile homes, um, the I think we all, have folks, how many of you have ever toured, you know, there's a company called Vermont who makes a hyper-efficient mobile home in White River. Have, have folks seen those? Um, they're expensive, right? It's not, the reality is to, to actually, it's always required a hefty sort of set of incentives to get those um, on the ground, I guess. Uh, so I think we all are, are hungry for a day where somehow those are a little more affordable. You know, I remember I used to work for Congressman Welsh, and I, uh, mm -hmm. Capstone held a little uh, sort of open house for one of their weatherization projects, and it was a mobile home, actually, I think, on the Barry Montpelier Road. And just seeing that, um, the challenge of really making a mobile home energy efficient, it, 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 and, and when, when Paul described probably the $5,000 of labor and uh, sort of materials that was going into this 1960s mobile home, it's, uh, it's important, right? And there's a reason they're doing that, and it's the right thing to do. But also, you wonder about sort of the overall sort of economic efficiency of that uh, kind of investment. As opposed to replacing it. Replacing it, so, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like, what is that model? But the rea you have to replace it. I mean, you know, our first community where we did work was Pownall, Vermont. <coughs> and Pownall, if you've never been there, has three uh, mobile home parks that were, that were there originally because they uh, had a horse track that then became a dog track, and those mobile homes were sort of for employee housing. Those, um, there was deep fear in amongst those mobile home communities about this model communities process. And this fear was that, that we were somehow going to close those mobile homes, right? And that is a real fear for people. It is the only roof over their head, the only affordable roof over their head. And so even if there's some alternative that's maybe an apartment in Bennington, like that, uh, for people who that's their, that's their home, uh, the, the, the amount of um, fear in that conversation was really real, you know, and it's, yeah, it's serious. I just wondered if you'd had any success stories to share. In my community, um, there is a, we have a mobile home park, and it's one, probably the largest source of affordable housing in town. Yep. Um, most of the residents own their units. Um, and comments that we had is, it may not be much, but it's mine, and I own it. Exactly. And they're very proud of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so the, but, but mobile homes are, you know, economically, they are steadily decreasing assets. I mean, it's like exactly. a car. That's and true. and so yeah. it's, it's economically, it may be hard to justify making the improvements to it. But nevertheless, you can't write off a whole sector of, of your community that way exactly. based on cost effectiveness. And so 
it, it's a real challenge, and that's why I'm raising it, because you have the opportunity to perhaps see some opportunities that may have, sort of, we've missed. You know, the other thing that I've seen is that um, there's a level of sort of grassroots <coughs> volunteer work in terms of just uh, sort of weatherization. There's a new program, actually, that started in Maine that new communities in Vermont are starting to do called the Window Dressers Program. And essentially what they pioneered is a way to build these window inserts that are reusable, right? Instead of putting up the plastic every year and, t and tearing it down, they have a really precise measuring system. And you go, they have a centralized location with, with materials that they've acquired to build these window inserts. And, th and it really, there's some thermal improvement that comes from that uh, in terms of saving people on, on their energy costs. And there's also a sort of community service element to that too, which is people can volunteer to make those window, uh, those window inserts. People can contribute to those window inserts for other people in their community. And I think a little bit of that catalyzing of uh, in, um, in William, at Williams College, they have an annual day of service where people go into the community and actually do sort of that seasonal weatherization work for anyone who wants it. And I, I, I think that does not get at the big picture thing by any scope, but I also think it's, it's that kind of work at the, at the grassroots level is um, important as well. Any talk about excessive air conditioning use? Mm. Or giant SUVs or brand new big trucks that everybody drives <laughs> around? You know, it seems like if we wanted to kind of change the perception that we're going after people who can least afford it, then we should at least sometimes talk about the people who could most afford to give up, maybe some luxuries or things like that. <laughs> I have to say, like, this is what I personally grapple with in this conversation. It's like, you, it, is, it is both a big community and policy conversation at the state level, the national level, but it's also an intensely personal conversation. And it's actually part of what draws me into this work, is that it's similar... Uh, I worked at the Department of Environmental Conservation a few years back. You know, the water quality conversation, we, we will get nowhere on the water quality conversation without a partnership with towns, right? Because you're on the ground. You have roads that you have to maintain. You, you have stormwater systems, right? We're going to get nowhere without a partnership with communities to get it done. And on the climate front, I also think that's true. Communities are the key partners in getting this work done. It can't just be some grand global solution. You are where that solution hits the ground. But also, it's not just communities. It's all of us like as individuals. And how do you have that conversation in a way that's enticing to communities and gets people involved as opposed to sort of uh, scolding and, and turns people off? Like, I, I haven't solved that, but like, it, it, yeah, it's, it's a rich vein to tap into, let's say. Mm -hmm. Hi, John. Rich Turner from uh, Williamstown. I just I want to applaud your efforts on uh, the climate economy. And I also want to put a plug in for the Leadership Summit. Um, I've been at the last two in Castleton and sat through your workshop on the uh, uh, climate economy there as well. It's um, so engaging with uh, other members of planning commission, select boards, leaders throughout the state, but also all the youth that, you know, that are brought to that um, workshop, for uh, the summit for the day. So I just, it, it is so engaging and um, so many awesome workshops that you can really look at starting some problem solving on <coughs> many different levels. And it's well worth taking a day of day of your time to invest um, in the leadership summit. Not sure where it's going to be next year, but I'll be there for sure. So okay. I want to thank you for your. I'll, I'll send that. You know, I appreciate that feedback. What's there were sixty different presenters that we had in Randolph, and the thing about VCRD is we're a teeny team of four people. So like the success of that summit is all about all of those friends, all of those great people who you can bring in as presenters, as facilitators. And that's really true of my model communities program. It's really true of our community visit work is like we, there's just this great team of people here in Vermont who are really interested in working with Vermont towns. And sometimes we're just the convener. We just sort of bring it all, bring it all together, so. Yeah, uh, I say, I want, first I want to say this has been great 
because this, this just as even what you were talking about, encourages me because you hear so much, you know, as you say, general, for the global or national or even statewide. And I, I know some people in this group, because sometimes I've opened my mouth about this, you, so it depends on the individual, like your mobile home. You can oh, all the mobile homes, they got to do this, they got to But P, you got to take into account people's feelings. This is my house, or this is my lane, or this is even the car or something. And a lot of these sweeping programs just seem to, well, you know, we have this program, and oh, the people are here, but they don't care. We just, you know, do over them. And, and uh, I, I'm so glad as somebody, and we're trying, as a group, is really thinking about the individual. What do they think? What can they do? Where, can they afford it? Can they not? Or do they, you know, do they see a need? And, and I think a lot of people don't want a tie of being told, oh, we must do this, or you must do that. You say, well, I, you know, it's, as you say, as Julie said, it's my, you know, it's my mobile home. It's their house. You just can't come in and say, oh, your home's wasting energy, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And uh, the National Post, so I'm so glad as, as a group that, you know, is trying to work, work on the problem, but work at it to, to get uh, into a group or a small group of individual level. So this has been great. Thank you. You know, with um, Efficiency Vermont staff who do these home energy visits, they have expertise and um, they're there to deploy that expertise, but what they talk about is their most effective tool to, de to deploy is really being a listener, right? So you walk around somebody's house, you see these opportunities, but ultimately you really got to listen to that homeowner and you, you have to um, meet them where they are. That's really what this, uh, to me, uh, what this is about. It's meeting communities where they are, and it's meeting individuals where they are. Uh, that's how to have a productive conversation. And to do that, you, you really have to l sort of listen uh, carefully, not just come in with sort of a, a, a big solution, I guess. So I'm wondering how, how many towns you actually are dealing with now. And I mean, I can't figure out the scope of you know, how many people are involved in this, and also, what kind of services do you pr pr provide as far as funding or um, helping to get funding, because a lot of these programs seem like they will need some money. Yeah, it's good. Let's get down brass tacks. <laughs> What's this really it's about? It's always about money. Wait a second. <laughs> so we've worked in, we, we, are, we are working or have worked in six towns over the course of the, of the three years, and, um, you know, what VCRD is lying is around <laughs> funding. I, what I don't bring with this program is a checkbook, right? I bring a process, I bring some staff support, I bring some partners, but I don't bring another chunk of money. Uh, what, uh, I think what you all know, so I almost don't need to say it, is when a community aligns around, around a priority and sort of shows some leadership, uh, a lot of times uh, funding will follow that, that kind of unity. And um, actually taking Pownall as a, an example, you know, Pownall, uh, we had an intense conversation in Pownall uh, for some of the reasons I mentioned. But, but one of the things Pownall really rallied around is recreation and trails. They just hosted a, you know, and what's interesting about our process is I'm long gone from Pownall. I haven't been in Pownall for a year and a half, but still some of the seeds of the conversation that was planted in Pownall are still sort of blossoming. So in Powell, you know, they got $60,000 to build a trail along the Hoosick River. VYCC was down there this summer building that trail. Um, Powell uh, hosted a series of events on, on their local farms. They got a little grant from the Vermont Community Foundation to do that kind of work. So we're kind of a partner in sort of coming up with creative ways to get solutions. Vermont, for VCRD, Vermont Community Foundation is another real core partner in our work. We try to bring them wherever we go. Similar with USDA Rural Development. I mean, we have a real treasure in USDA Rural Development. There's, the, you know, 
again, those communities that figure out how to effectively access some of those programs um, are, it's always worth doing and building those relationships with the great team uh, at USDA Rural Development. I, I think your program sounds great. I just, I was wondering if a town was interested, how would they get involved and how do you choose the towns that you work with? We, um, we've had an application, sort of an RFP process the last, last three years, and I think we'll do something similar to that this year. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of thinking we'll sort of be recruiting both for that larger process and the cohort, uh, the accelerator cohort at the same time, because mm -hmm. I think some people are, aren't actually going to be sure which category they might go in. So I think we'll probably do that as a, as a simultaneous <coughs> thing. You know, what, for us, what we need to know, as I mentioned, we, we ask for like a letter or a show of support from the select board because we want the, the body, the governance body to invite this process in. But then what, um, what, we, what I find most enticing is when a community brings together sort of a non-traditional group of allies to say, you know what, this process, we think this process has value. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I, Randolph, we had a really robust conversation in Randolph and it's still sort of chugging along, uh, and and what Randolph was able to pull together was the superintendent, the head of Vermont Technical College, the head of the hospital, but also some grassroots folks as well around the table to say, you know what, this is a good opportunity for us, in part catalyzed by like the closing of that department store and the concern about downtown. Mm -hmm. And so um, st I would say uh, probably late October is when we will um, put out some guidance around uh, how to apply for, for the company. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And, you know, feel free, Bonnie knows how to get in touch with me, but, um, yeah, uh, vtrural.org uh, slash model communities is where you can find that information. Great. Uh, thank you. Well, I thank you I very can, much. I thank you. Uh, I have one point of personal privilege before I get uh, give up the microphone, which is, I am the treasurer of the Wrightsville Beach Recreation District. <laughs> and I just want to express real appreciation for the support that you all at the Regional Planning Commission give to the Beach District and our work. We really value that partnership. It, it really, you know, what I appreciate about Bonnie and the team at the Regional Planning Commission is like, you really see the value in multi-town collaborations. Maybe that's across the whole region, or maybe it's just the four towns of the Beach District. But your willingness to support multi-town work is, uh, I think, really important. So thank you all thank you. For, for what you did. You're very good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. All right. What are we moving on to next? Time for municipal plan approval and confirmation of the planning process for the town of it's Warren, right? Yes. Um, Bill, I'll let you take it. Thanks okay. very much. <coughs> uh, so we had a sleep on the right page. Yeah. Had a meeting on August 27th, and uh, we met to the Warren Zone Administrator and uh, the Warren Planning Commission Vice Chair. Right? Thank you for those people here tonight. Um, and uh, we asked them some questions uh, about uh, housing, child care, and their energy proposal. Um, and the thing I remember most was uh, how much we talked about uh, Airbnbs <laughs> and how much effect they have on their their ability to uh, to have enough housing at all, rather than you know, never mind uh, low income housing. But um, yeah, any comments about? I think Bill kind of captured the conversation, and I just wanted to um, say that our uh, assistant planner Zach Meyer did a lot of the staff work in in the review and the coordination um, of the meeting, and that um, it, what was interesting to me um, during that meeting was the uh, Warren's recognition of the amount of seasonal housing that they have, and um, that they recognize that a substantial amount of their condominium housing stock is affordable for wealthy people to own, but to lay vacant 
for the majority of the year. And that's a situation which they haven't quite figured out how to tackle yet. <laughs> but they're in a unique position where there is a tremendous amount of what would be considered vacant housing in the town, but they still have um, the need for how year-round housing in the town. So what part of the year is it vacant? Uh, most of the year. The, 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 the folks that could own these condos can just come for a weekend here and there, and they don't find the need They're to... They're so cheap, they don't even bother to rent them out. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Didn't you sign it? Warren. Okay. No, we should. <laughs> does anyone does anyone have any questions or okay. sure, Steve? Um, <clears throat> did the topic of uh, housing for people who work at the uh, ski area and in the resort community <laughs> as a whole come up? And uh, I know that's a big issue for most resort communities. But how did that I think conversation? It did, I think it did, and I think the, again there was the problem that uh, uh, with, with things like Airbnb, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, housing that could be available to those people is, is being used for that kind of thing. So they're pressed for that yeah. as well. And they did, they did <coughs> note that they were looking at some zoning changes, um, just making a, a minor modification to their uh, definition of what is considered a boarding house to modify that language with the hopes that that would allow um, Sugarbush to develop some additional housing for some of their seasonal workforce. Uh, but I, I believe that was um, kind of one small step in, in the, the greater scheme of kind of where they hope to be in the future. Yeah, I was just going to say Sugar Bush has been doing a lot of investing um, because they've had to. Mm -hmm. And they also have a program called Tenants for Turns that engage the wider community in housing someone who works at the ski area. And in, in exchange, you get a ski pass. Mm. <laughs> or a gym castle. Nice. Um, as a farmer owner of uh, three condos in uh, Warren, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the units themselves are 60s era units. Mm. And they're all uh, heated with electric radiant heat. <laughs> Um, so that's that's the kind of thing that people will generally try and um, build in propane heaters and whatnot to, to uh, take it over. And they've all got a wood fireplace that sucks all the air out of the <laughs> building. So, uh, you know, usually putting in a, a, um, a heating unit, uh, which we did in two of our units, uh, makes it uh, more usable for year-round. Um, so, it, and I think that's that's what a lot of these condo units are up against. Weatherization. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. I mean, Back just, to weatherization. Just what talking about here. Right. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Go ahead. Yeah, it, it's probably not germane to the town plan, but. When's the last time somebody from Warren came to one of these meetings? Uh, that Camilla thing? Mm -hmm. She was here um, earlier in the summer. I think and actually, Dr. Worth, the new person came in July. Um, yeah. Generally, they try and have someone from their planning commission. But for both Faston and Warren, their planning commission meets the same night we do. Mm -hmm. So when you, when they see something that's of particular instance or when we call them up and say we really need your vote, they make sure they're here, but they're missing their local planning commission meeting. So it's a challenge for them. They want to make the planning link. But the timing doesn't work. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the uh, town plan review committee uh, is recommending to the entire commission that. Uh, that they approve the Warren plan and also the uh, planning process. So two different things. I don't know if you want to okay. take two different votes on that. Um, just as a hint, there's there are some bullets that will guide us in the motions that would be necessary to 
uh, move this ahead. It's right on the agenda under the approval agenda item. If anyone would like to make those motions, you can do it separately or together, however you would like. <laughs> Peter? Yes, I move that we approve the municipal plan per 24 BSA. Section 4350, subsection <laughs> B, and confirm the municipality's planning process versus uh, per 24 BSA, section 4350, subsection A, and approve the signature of the CBRBC uh, resolution by the chair. Wonderful said. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I can read. <laughs> I'll second. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. um, Peter Moose and... We'll say we seconded. Um, any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All those abstaining? The motion passes and Warren's town plan is approved. Thank you very much and congratulations to Warren. Next up is the meeting minutes of July 9th, 2019. Does anyone have any comments or corrections or? Anything else to add to the minutes? Minutes are perfect, I assume. Make a motion on approving the minutes? Sure, I'll move to approve the minutes of July 9th, 2019, as presented. I'll second that. Uh, I think we had Julie first. Steve uh, moves to approve the minutes and Julie seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? <coughs> All those abstaining? And the minutes are approved. Next up are reports. Do you want to say anything about the reports? They're at page, oh, no, 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 nope, they're actually at the end. Let's see, page 10. Page 10. Page 10. So these were sent as supplemental. Um, they represent July and August, which is why they're a little longer than usual. Staff's been extra busy, but it is two months. Um, let's see, highlights, is there anything land use conversations you've been having with, say, Middlesex? Um, geez. Middlesex, let's see, um, we've had, we've been working with a couple of municipalities on submitting their village center designation applications, um, uh, that was, um, by the systems for uh, Middlesex and uh, East Montpelier. I'd like to highlight that on October 2nd, we're having a regional energy roundtable that you're all invited to participate in. We're co-sponsoring it with the, Council, the Vermont Natural Resources Council and the Vermont Council on Rural Development. That's in part bringing energy committees together, but it's really about bringing together anyone interested in energy actions on the ground. So you don't need to be part of a committee. If you're a citizen interested, you can show up and we'll link you with this wonderful group of people um, that you can use as a resource to implement things on the ground. Julie? Um, will you be putting together some sort of flyer, electronic, digital flyer for this? Because it, it, it makes it a lot easier to get the word out if we've got something we can just forward to all the people we think are going to be interested in this. I believe we already sent out oh, yes. an e-invite, right, right. but I don't know that it's in flyer form yet. It was an email. So, yes. So, I may have not appreciated it. It wasn't a flyer. No, it wasn't a flyer, it was an email, so we'll do the, the flyer next. Okay. Okay. Want to add that we welcomed our VISTA And we welcomed in August our new VISTA member, Nick Kramer from Corinth. Um, he'll be with us for a year through Serve Vermont VISTA, AmeriCorps VISTA. And Nick is working on a variety of activities, 
Starting this week, he's driving all of your roads to the extent possible and assessing your cell service and no. what kind of cell service you have. Don't he's have. not. <laughs> <Or don't laughs> have. He has competed with Worcester, or Woodbury and most of Cabot. Is my geography correct? Um, so he is tackling town by town, working through. You won't have your data for a while. Um, but for those of you hoping to improve your cell service or challenge the service you have, that's a good place to start, and you can build that into local and regional planning. He's also working on some activities related to housing and child care to help municipalities identify what more could we be doing. What's kind of a menu of things towns are doing out there or could be doing? He'll be cruising through your municipal plans, <coughs> consulting with our partners, and eventually presenting some ideas at planning and zoning roundtables this spring. And the last piece he's doing is helping to organize those energy roundtables and supporting our uh, municipal volunteers in that capacity. He's got a lot of other minor things, but those are his major activities. So we're sure happy to have him. Busy. <laughs> it is, <laughs> and unlike most Volunteers of Regional Planning Commission gets his degree is mathematics. So he's diving into statistics for us. Nice. <laughs> Julie. Um, I'd just like to give a plug for this energy roundtable. Um, I worked for a while with one in a different region, and um, the municipal participants, they weren't necessarily from a formal energy committee. Sometimes they were, sometimes they were an informal energy committee. Sometimes they were just some sort of a grassroots version group interested in it. Um, but they found it really helpful to come together and share with, you know, this is what we're doing in our town. These are the, you know, how, how the challenges we've had. These are things that have worked really well for us. And that sharing of ideas really inspired a lot of the participants. And uh, certainly we had amazing attendance every single meeting, and, which I think is indicative of that they found that there was a va real value in it. Um, so I think this is a real opportunity, and I am pleased that Central Vermont RPC is, is relaunching this sort of activity. So how many towns did you say had energy committees? I think we have eight or nine in our region that have energy committees. A formal currently operating energy committees. There are other communities. John mentioned a conversation in the Mad River Valley, where I don't believe any of the communities have an energy, a formal energy committee before anymore, but they have individuals interested in taking action. So this is one way to take that individual if their community can't form a full energy committee and just network them with other people so they have the support they need. If they want to hold a drive electric event, who else has done this so you're not reinventing? These are other folks who have flyers, can tell you what it takes to make it happen. Our first forum's focusing on transportation. That's our largest energy use section, segment. And folks like the Northfield Energy Committee are coming to talk about their week-long Let's Ride Transit initiative. It's a gentleman from Worcester who started a, it's called a hitching post. If you mm -hmm. didn't see that in the Times Argus, it's a carpool. And I, I say it's patterned after something I saw in Washington, D.C. You're there waiting as an individual right outside the coffee shop, and the person drives by and can pick you up, and essentially what you've done is pre-purchase them a coffee at the coffee shop, and you give them a token that they can cash in at the coffee shop for their coffee. So he expanded it a little bit, and I think in their first few weeks they had six or seven links for rides. So it's, it's an informal way to do it that involves some economic benefit in their community. So ideas like that that are out there are some of the things we'll be talking about. Great. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions or comments about the staff reports? Go ahead. Uh, I would certainly hope that this inventory of the cell service that Nick's working on, they can have something done for Roxburgh before <laughs> the town meeting. We have no cell service in town. None? Wow. Well, I guess very limited. And it's every year we've had a repeater put in right in, in the village, and that the, the provider went out, hmm. went bankrupt, and that didn't work. And every, for the last 10 years, it comes up at every every town meeting. 
<laughs> What's the status of the cells? <laughs> okay. He is doing this, the it's cell testing March, in no. two parts because we're trying to do it with leaf on, which is when your worst cell service is, as opposed to leaf off when all those signs can get through. So it's a better indicator of actual service. So I will let him know we somewhat have in prioritized have communities that are talking <laughs> about it, right? So he'll be driving now through leaf off and then in spring, which is why. So how do, um, in Woodbury, of course, how do we find out what Nick found out? <laughs> um, after Nick I has driven all that he can service. this year, mm -hmm. the public service department, we're using their equipment, will download the data, and Ashley and Pam will be working on some maps, and then you will know. I can't guarantee you a timeline on that. Um, Sometime. But the idea is that it turns around fairly quickly. I would hope by December the fall ones would have their information. We're convincing the Public Service Department initially they wanted all RPCs to do the full state survey before they downloaded the data. We were working to convince them, and I think Nick did a pretty good job that said, but if I mess up and corrupt it, everybody's wasting their time. So I believe they down, Lamoille had the equipment before us. I believe they downloaded Lamoille, and they'll download us after the fact. So. Anyone else? Go ahead, Lee. Hi. <clears throat> just a uh, note on the project review committee, and uh, I'd just like to emphasize what we had done on that. It's, uh, we were looking at a project for a fairly large solar energy system that comes in that did not have storage associated with it. And uh, the month before that, we had a presentation in here that said that storage was pretty necessary in this area because of, we don't have that well uh, defined or that amount of infrastructure uh, to serve what we would generate in this area. So storage would be necessary or to improve the infrastructure. And I, I think we should look at our plan again that uh, and see if we should be saying that the project is part of our regional plan, the energy section that we should be saying that storage should be a part of that, which we don't say that in our plan. You will be happy to hear that the executive committee has asked for a plan of action to finish plan Central Vermont, which Claire is working on and will at some point meet with the regional plan committee hopefully this month, early next month, um, to vet and then bring that forward so we can look at how soon can we address those. Anyone else? Go ahead, Ron. Yes, uh, if you mentioned uh, energy store, she was, the talk we had was very good. Mm -hmm. um, I think if we're going to put that in, which is probably a wise thing to do, we're going to have to give some guidelines as to what we mean by storage. It's a power company, she said, a lot of their storage is uh, uh, equipment that has short-term <coughs> road leveling and phase matching and so on. Uh, what do we do? And the stuff you read doesn't, I uh, read a lot of this stuff in energy, so, and they, obviously all these people don't live in Vermont and realize uh, two or three weeks at a time in the winter where we have almost zero solar because there's no, you know, the sun is low and the clouds. Are. So how much are we going to require storage for doing, you know, uh, they say storage in, in the desert of Los Angeles is one thing, the storage here is, you know, we get two, three weeks cloudy stuff and really, 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 really. And, um, you know, so how much storage are we looking at? Uh, I think that would have to be at least a, uh, somehow in the guidelines, and I think we definitely have to mention storage, because renewable energy without storage is, doesn't make sense. So keep that in mind when we talk about it. And I don't know how we find out how much you need, but the power company will have to tell you how much they, you know, they 
doing how much they can cut pe people back on an optional electric power and that. So I think that some has to we have to investigate, not only in storage, but its purpose and how how much and how much can so people don't think they can you know it's going to be stored forever either. Right. And the space is going to take up. Right. You're going to store, you're going to store stuff. They, no matter how you <coughs> store it, it's going to take up space. And now, for instance, if you use lithium batteries, uh, like Green Mountain is using for load leveling, that they, they can do more stuff probably on their own property, as they say. But if you have looking for storage for long-term supply, mm -hmm. then we're going to have to be looking for places to put these batteries. And if someone says, we're going to put in a, a two houses for lithium batteries in your backyard, that's not, you know. So that we have to take, in, take into account. Right. Another should, thing too, Ron, is batteries aren't the only kind of storage. No. Mm -hmm. We have our hot water tanks. Yeah, but I'm talking storage, about uh, for, and ice storage. There's a lot of yeah, but like for for electric generation. You know. Well, when you have excess solar in the day, and if we had grid integrated water heaters in our homes, you could actually use set it into. The yeah, but you're not going to generate much electricity. Either. You store heat. When you store heat. heat but I'm talking about yeah. electric use. But it's no. it's it's using. Excess electricity when it's cheap. Yeah, that's right. In other forms besides the battery. So no, but I'm just thinking of uh, turning on your lights. I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, I know you're right. Storage, storage is, is yeah, it's a big, I, it's I'm a big concept. It's from from <coughs> just an electrical, you know, gotcha. running your water pump or running your lights or something, rather than therm using the, you know, the heat hot water, which is you know for your thermal storage. They get yes. Yeah, uh, since you bring that up, we may have to make a distinction of what we're looking at. Great, thank you. I think we have a lot of work to do on energy still, then it sounds like. Um, <laughs> I do want to say thank you to the three commissioners, Laura, Dara, and Ron, who came to the Transportation Climate Initiative um, workshop. Discussion. Yeah. Discussion. Yeah. Discussion last was, Friday. Was, yeah. We got a lot of positive feedback yeah, was, from some participants, good. legislators, the state folks yeah, about the value of that discussion in figuring out not just dreaming pipe dreams yeah, about true. what we could do, but what the realities yeah, were in trying to good. implement some of those solutions and things to take into account. Yeah, that's good. I think, one, I think one of the most interesting suggestions I heard, and one that I hadn't really thought of, was to use school buses to also mm -hmm. transport adults because the public transit doesn't really go in many places. They just go on, yeah. on you know, the main routes, but the school buses go everywhere. So you could, if you could find a way to put adults on those buses, you might be able to get more. I don't know if the school districts would go along with it, but... <laughs> the reality with that one is the federal laws related to school buses prohibit it. When the there kids are on the buses. When the kids are not on the buses, you could. So that doesn't mean you can't use them, but you have to think creatively about it. And there are folks around the state looking yeah. at that. Good. I hope they put seat belts in too. They're very uncomfortable though. <laughs> 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 field trips. They are not designed for it. Can I call most to balance the <laughs> All right, before we go, um, I just wanted to thank some people. Um, thanks to Bill and your project review committee for working. We had a lot of town plans this summer, so you guys did a lot of work. Thank you very much. Um, Paula Emery is back. We wanted to welcome you back. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Um, and we wanted to say goodbye to Kirby Keaton. I think this is your last meeting with us. And thank you very much for your service, and we'll miss you on the regional no. plan committee. Uh, they don't they, know. Okay, so I guess that, that, that warrants some explanation. Um, so we recently had the chair of the Montpelier Planning Commission step down, and um, I'm filling in. Um, so to focus on those duties, another member of the Montpelier Planning Commission will come as a representative here. You're sticking around now. Uh, I'll still be around. Okay. I'll still That's be good. on the Montpelier Planning Commission. Um, so Marcella Dent will be the new representative. I, I anticipate, actually, this is, it hasn't been confirmed by the city council yet, but 
<coughs> be nominated as a, as a planning commission. Uh, I'm one of our members, Marcella Dent, so we anticipate that she'll be here. And she's really great. She's younger and more energetic than me. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I thought you were young. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Younger yet. Yeah. 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 The, the average yeah. age is yeah. early. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to go down that way a little bit more. Yeah. That's good. Uh, That's good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Gray hair stuff. Um, is anybody else? Don? Oh, you were going to make, I'm sorry. Go for it. It's time. Um, motion to adjourn. <laughs> Do we have a second? It does it every time. Second. Five seconds. Um, I abstain. <laughs> <laughs> you can stay. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Standing. Goodbye. Thank you.